start. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us on our Mingle Mastermind. Um, uh, today we're uh, talking about why your vote matters. That's, you know, that's not something we often talk about in the fashion industry, but as, um, you know, things started happening with trade wars and um, also uh, a, lot of, a lot has come up with uh, small businesses and, and how they're going to survive through COVID needing government assistance. I thought that this was a really great time to talk about these issues and really educate everyone in why it's really important to pay attention to these issues and, and vote. So um, thank you everyone for joining us. We have a very esteemed panel today. So uh, I want to introduce Samuel Alexander, who is the founder and CEO of C2C fashion and technology company. Hi, Samuel, how are you doing? Well, well, everyone, how are you today? Can you tell us a little bit about your company? Uh, yeah, I'm here based in Austin, Texas, and I've been in the fashion industry for the last uh, 40 years. And uh, I work with companies like Levi Strauss, Gloria Vanderbilt, Jones New York. I can go through the list, but I probably work with every major corporation in the United States. I do production. Uh, we're focusing on nanobiotech integrated smart fashion. Uh, the wearable technology industry is a $150 billion industry on the horizon, so we've already moved that direction. Um, we have uh, a new ecosystem that's a global enterprise ecosystem that basically gives you the ability to do business all over the world. And we have our own video conferencing, which works out very well, so <laughs> actually it's rated higher than Zoom at this point. Uh, we, we are now looking at how to reestablish the fashion industry based on technology. Very cool. Lots, lots of really great experience there that uh, you're going to be able to share with us. I really appreciate that you coming on. Um, Hillary Jacquemin is a government affairs consultant based in DC. Um, and she also has her own uh, blog called Politically in Fashion. Hi, Hillary. How are you? I'm Melissa. Hi, panelists. Nice to see everybody. Can you tell us a little bit about your experience and your background in government affairs? Sure. Um, again, thank you everyone for having me here today. As Melissa said, my name is Hillary. I'm based in Washington, D.C. I'm a government affairs consultant. I have my own business that I started a few years ago, and I focus on working with companies uh, primarily in New York uh, to advance their legislative and political needs in, in Washington and in New York State and city as well. Um, before my company, I worked on Capitol Hill for about a dozen years. I worked in both the House and the Senate. And I also was the director of uh, New York Governor Cuomo's office here in Washington, his federal affairs office. Oh, wow. I didn't know you were connected with Governor Cuomo. Yes. Okay. So I, I, I started Politically in Fashion uh, this year. Um, it's an online community for those in the fashion industry to engage on legislative and regulatory and political issues that are so key to our industry. And as Melissa said, this is something we haven't engaged in a lot in the past and we really should. So I'm super excited to be able to talk about this more with everyone today. Yeah, and I, I just love bringing in, uh, you know, these real substantive issues into fashion mingle. So I really hope that we can work on some things in the future to help really educate um, the industry on these really important topics that they need to understand how it affects their business. Yeah. Uh, so, Miss Denisha, we have our top model coach who's representing us as uh, someone in the modeling industry, someone who owns their own business that you, uh, you coach models. Um, you're also an author. And so tell us a little bit about your business, Miss Denisha. Hello, everyone, and thank you so much, Melissa, for bringing me back. That was really an honor, and it was kind of you to do so. So uh, I'm in my studio today, actually, and this is where I actually teach. I, I'm a top model coach as well as an industry model myself, and I am proud to say I just turned 50 this year. So um, I let models know that they can do this literally for the rest of their life. You know, um, I am a big advocate on helping models not get scammed, not get taken advantage of in the business. Um, I become like a mother hand to some degree and a mentor to a lot of the young um, aspiring models, not only models, but I work with dancers, singers, artists, um, anyone that's really trying to reach their goals and dreams in the industry. 
of entertainment. So that's yeah. what I do. I started a small agency as well two years ago, but I only represent those that come through my program, which is called the Maui Boot Camp. Yeah, awesome, awesome. Yeah. And we have Sharim Mobahead, who is our resident fashion lawyer. Um, how are you doing, Sharim? I'm doing well, thank you, Melissa. And I'm so honored to be on this panel today and have everyone here, um, you know, be a part of this conversation, which is incredibly important. And being a branding lawyer and having gone through COVID and helping, you know, go through the issues that my clients have faced over the past uh, several months in terms of getting their businesses back up and running. Um, it's definitely a conversation we need to have and we need to raise awareness of, of some of the, the limitations that have been put, unfortunately, to these minority-owned businesses. So glad to be here and happy to um, be part of the conversation. Thanks so much. And uh, we have Runa Ray, who's a fashion designer and has, uh, you, uh, she comes of us with the perspective of having a company based in India and then also operating her business in the United States. Thanks for joining us, Runa. Thank you, Melissa. Hello, everyone. Nice to be on board again. I always like fashion mingle sessions because it's so educative and fun at the same time. Uh, so, yes, yeah, sorry, Runa. Melissa. Well, no, I would also wanted to mention that you're very active with the UN, which gives us a very global perspective on the conversation today. So uh, I would like to call myself a fashion environmentalist because I use fashion to advocate for policy change uh, as activism. I have been involved with a few projects with the United Nations with the advancement of its SDG goals. Uh, my company is based in India, but because of COVID, uh, there have been a lot of changes. So I've moved here to the U.S. And I was discussing with Melissa, we're probably going to think of restructuring the entire organization and thinking as to how we could probably get operations started in the U.S. And in the meantime, I'm also speaking to a lot of designers and companies and uh, educating them on nature-based solutions that they could use for the advancement of the SDG goals and how they could probably incorporate it into their production processes. So that's in a nutshell with what I'm doing right now. Thank you. Wonderful. Wonderful. And we've got Dee Rivera, who's the CEO of DCG Public Relations. And she's, she's like a master of the gig economy. She's the really gonna, she's got lots of things going on all the time. And uh, so uh, Dee, tell us what you have going on right now, because you've always got something new going on. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you for having me on this panel, which is very, very important. So I'm looking forward to it. Um, we are right now working on Latinistas.com's uh, upcoming holiday issue. We're trying to have a holiday event. I don't know if that's going to be feasible to have it in person. It may be a very small party, but we're working on our upcoming issue. We're working on a bunch of client campaigns, uh, morning shows, holiday gift guides, and then we're working on next year as well. As you know, Melissa, Fashion Week is like around the corner. For I don't want to hear it. <laughs> oh my God, it's like, okay, next. <laughs> so I'm just like trying to take care of one thing at a time and trying to stay calm because, you know, as you know, I, I've been getting headaches and stuff. So mm -hmm. just try to be, uh, oh my yeah. Yeah, D, D and I put ourselves through the ringer with producing Times Square Fashion Week, which just about killed both of us. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we're, alive. But, we're alive to tell the tale. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But, um, but you know, 2021 should look really good for uh, fashion shows as we ease yeah. back into normal life, if we could keep our numbers lower yeah. uh, in New York City. Yeah. I love the images, though. They were fantastic. Yeah, yeah, it was a, it was a, it, it was just a beautiful event. It was a very exciting to be right in the center of Times Square. Mm -hmm. It was a very, you know, we had to keep it under 50 people. So about the only people who could participate were the people who actually were, were working the event or were the designers, you know, the models, that kind of thing. So that was unique, but I think everybody appreciated the opportunity to do something special. Um, yeah. And it was, you know, it, and the weather was beautiful. We were super lucky. And great visibility for the designers. It was a fantastic yeah. the platform. Everything was great for it. I loved it. 
I love yeah. it. Awesome. That That's wonderful to hear from a, a New York Fashion Week designer such as yourself yeah. who has, Runa's actually done three or four New York Fashion Weeks, mm -hmm. the official schedule, the big shows all by herself. So uh, that's high praise coming from you, Runa. Absolutely. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So, okay, well, let's get started on our topics today. Um, we want to, you know, the first thing I'd like to talk about is, you know, how, um, you know, how voting uh, affects businesses, number one. You know, what are some of the uh, issues, and, and Hillary, maybe we'll just start with you. What are some of the issues that affect uh, businesses that our legislators make decisions about at the state level, as well as at the federal level, that really impact our businesses? Sure. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll, later I hope let's talk a little bit more about voting as well, but uh, some of the issues that are are most important to the industry. Oop, sorry, my camera went away. Hold on. No, we can see you. Yeah, okay, we there we go. Yeah. Okay, sorry about that. Um, you know, so the fashion industry is a very broad industry, right? So it encompasses so many different legislative areas. Um, obviously, design issues, so you have that under the IP umbrella, um, things like copyright and trademark and trade dress, things like that. Um, but you also have small business issues, as folks were already starting to talk about, and we saw the importance of that during during COVID and what kind of relief measures were, were passed by the government for small businesses. Uh, trade issues are huge. Um, there are several pending trade deals right now with the EU, um, with France, with Great Britain. Uh, there's a, what's called a generalized system of preferences, uh, which is very impactful for trade with Africa. We also have immigration issues, right? All the visas that are out there that uh, our designers uh, utilize for coming here, our models util utilize for coming here, students, fashion students utilize for coming to the United States. Those are all really in jeopardy right now. Uh, mm -hmm. Postal service, right? So for you, you sell your items, you want to get things to your customers, you need a viable postal service. Well, we've all seen what's playing out of the press and the postal service. Uh, tax issues are, are very important. Um, and one in particular, online sales tax. So if you sell your items online, you now have to, states are collecting sales tax, regardless of whether or not you have a physical presence in that state. Um, and then two particularly big ones, which we can touch on at some point, uh, are environmental issues uh, and tech issues. Mm -hmm. um, and so that, and this is a sort of an overview, but you know, I, I, yeah. I think it'd be hard to find an issue that doesn't somehow impact the industry. But those are just some top ones that come to mind. Yeah, and that, that was a, a really good rundown. I really appreciate that um, because, you know, as a business owner, you're so busy just trying to, uh, you know, operate your business every day that sometimes you really don't take the time to learn about these issues and you don't even realize they're affecting you until it's too late. So, um, so I'd like to bring on Samuel because I think of all of us here on the panel, you've got the longest um, uh, work experience with the fashion industry and you work uh, with corporate fashion. So I'm sure you've seen uh, a lot from the perspective of issues that have affected uh, corporate fashion, but also the fact that you own your own business. So you're an entrepreneur. Can you give us some perspective on um, what you see as some of the issues um, that we need to, to be uh, careful to watch for and how things have affected you in the past? Well, the first thing you have to take into consideration is that we've lost 42,000 retailers in the last two and a half years. Uh, you also have to take into consideration that all of the trade laws have changed for duty and different uh, types of things that we have to deal with every day. Uh, for me, fortunately, I was in a transition of reshoring my business back to the U.S. because contrary to what everyone believes, China had already started shutting down, uh, doing production and moving over to a service-oriented uh, country. So we're basically reshoring here. We're also building out factories here in the U.S., but we're using new technologies to build those factories out. Uh, we just uh, built a factory here in Austin that we partnered with Gerber Technology and we built an advanced manufacturing facility that is state-of-the-art, $14 million facility that we just finished up. And what we're doing is tri-sector integration. We're taking government, uh, private industry, and uh, the uh, education at universities and implementing these 
factories into the universities because the biggest problem we're gonna have going forward here in the US is the human resource issue. There is a major problem with having people capable of doing the jobs that we need them to do. Just in Austin alone, we've got 40,000 jobs available that people are not qualified for. Uh, so what we're looking at at the university level is doing stackable certifications to give people fast training, to get them up to speed on all the new technologies. As you probably, as everyone knows, probably already knows that uh, Gerber, I'm sorry, that uh, Tesla just moved a, a manufacturing facility here. Apple's building out facilities. We've got every major tech company in the world building out huge facilities here. Just to give you an idea, Oracle's building a, over a million, over 10 million square foot facility right now. Uh, Google has a second 22 story tower going up as we talk. Uh, what we're doing on the reshoring is, I'm sure everyone's heard, but we have uh, Louis Vuitton just built a factory in Fort Worth. We also have Coco Chanel has just built a factory here in Austin. So a lot of the European companies are moving here to Austin. Uh, one of the things that I do is I work with the local state and federal government on helping to go work through the issues that we're having. Uh, I, don't, I work with IFAI, which I'm sure everyone knows about here. That's our trade industry for our, all of our technology innovation. I uh, work with IPC, which we're util utilizing uh, the circular economy for sustainability because all the products that we're making with wearables, we have to set the standards up up front to be able to recycle the products from the wearables as they, as they go out of existence. So we're working on a lot of things on the background that probably will, will affect everyone down the road, but we're also setting up a lot of the guidelines from the backside now so that we don't have the issues with all the things that you see with the cell phone industry and some of the other industries. Mm -hmm. um, the FDA, believe it or not, is we work directly with the FDA on, on a lot of the products that we're dealing with now because a lot of the, the, the biotech technology that we're using, we have to have it approved by the FDA. Uh, so there's a lot of things that are going on in that area. We're kind of confused right now on some of the duties and things that we're having to deal with. My brokers that I that do all those those type of deals that, you know, when I ask them a question, like they're saying, well, let me get back to you. You've got to do some research on that because there's no clear pat pattern to what's going on now with, with our government as mm -hmm. far as the uh, relationships that we have with the countries, even here, which I've moved back into Peru and Mexico with some of the factories and uh, the factories that we're building here, are mainly for uh, wearable technology. So anything that we're doing, mass production, we're doing in, in uh, Peru and Mexico now. Mm -hmm. Well, you bring up a really um, good point. You know, that's the thing that I really worried about with the, you know, when the trade war stuff happened, because it's a huge financial burden for a company to actually have to move their production, but also to deal with all these changes in, in duties and taxes. And that actually, you know, not having stability in how in these laws is is really difficult for a company to maneuver through, right? What, what you're going to have to really pay attention to are the shortages that you're already starting to see. What the logistics issue was, we've got a broken logistics system because of what happened in China first. And what you have to take in consideration is the second quarter, third quarter, first part of the third quarter was our production for the third and fourth quarter of our year. And we pretty much missed that cycle. Not only that, the products that we had in the works because we worked three to six months out are not the products that the consumer is demanding now because their lifestyle has mm -hmm. changed completely. And I'm sure right now, you know, if you go out and try to find certain things like bicycles and desks and chairs and big office products, the home furnishing business is going through the roof right now because people are, are looking at two things right now, safety and comfort. Mm -hmm. And those are the two major areas that you have to focus in on if you're building a new business now. And that's what I think a lot of our industry has to realize. Most of the factories we did, uh, we were working with IPC and helping the factories retool to make PPE. So most of the factories here in the country right now is manufacturing PPE. They're not even manufacturing clothing anymore. So there's just so many changes that are going on as we mm -hmm. sit here that are in the background that is affecting, that are affecting everyone as we move forward. So as far as, the stability in the government right now would be helpful. The, the, also, the, the money that you're talking about, the, the PPP money, uh, the PPP money never made it to 
our industry to the extent that we needed it with the young designers because it was based on employees. Most of the, the young designers don't have employees. So it never really made it to them except for the $1,200 that they got from the, like everyone else got. So, but the good news is, is there is money in the states right now that is still a part of PPE that it's gonna be designated to be able to work with helping us rebuild. And that's what we have to focus in on is getting the legislation set forth that making sure that that money is distributed in a manner that's going to help us rebuild an industry that's going to be a sustainable industry because the way that we understand our industry is over with everything we're all starting from zero now and if you don't see zero and it's going forward and how you can function in the new industry then you're not going to be able to survive in this industry and you're about to see the bulk of the rest of the industry that we have go under because the ones that don't make the transition won't make it to the end of the year and you've already seen how many companies have already gone. And I'm not talking small ones. I'm talking from the, the big right. boys all the way down. And they don't even talk about the small industries that have gone out. Yeah. So. Uh, Sharin, you deal with, uh, you know, a variety of sized businesses. I know you've been working a lot on helping your clients get the, um, the stimulus money. Uh, can't, you know, we're, you know, over six months out on that deal, how have your clients survived this period? Um, yeah, thanks, Melissa. Yes, I mean, hearing hearing what Hillary and Samuel have already said uh, and speaking about what I've seen just directly on the ground working with these clients in the fashion industry and the statistics don't lie. Um, you know, they, there's been, you know, polls and, and things that have, uh, have spoken about what was actually happening and who got the money. And, and it was definitely not small businesses. It was not the majority of the people in the fashion industry. It was not the African American or Latinx owned businesses who for the most part are independents or sole proprietors, no other employees, and they just didn't qualify. And um, even those that had relationships with banks, because that was, you know, obviously the banks were favoring, um, you know, trying to mitigate their risks and favoring clients and customers that, um, you know, that had longer standing relationships. And that's another issue with the minority community that doesn't have those relationships with, with the banks. Um, so, you know, trying to get in line it was like, you know, back at the line. And most of them didn't get the first round. And then when the second round even, you know, occurred and they had all the paperwork in place and there was always an excuse and always an issue that they just couldn't get around. So, you know, for the most part, I had, um, you know, the clients that, that did get something, uh, it was not what they asked for. It was certainly not um, nearly what they asked for and, you know, uh, two thirds didn't get any of it. So, um, you know, so they had to rely on what they could um, to, to, to just get through these last few months. And, and some have been successful just by being able to pivot, being able to scrape and being able to just change their lifestyles completely. But, you know, um, having to do things really the hard way in order to, to get through. So, Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's definitely needs to be some changes made in the legislature because, um, you know, what was designated by the SBA and, and even, you know, in the second round saying that they would focus on minority owned businesses and women owned businesses. And we got excited for that. Um, but the reality is the banks didn't do it. Mm -hmm. And even the SBA came out and said, yeah, we realized that the bank didn't do it. And there was no oversight. There was no, there was no way to control what the banks did. And that's part of the problem is here we are putting money in the hands of the banks and they're going to choose who they want to work with. And for the most part, they're going to work with the, the businesses that bring in the business for them, you know? Um, so that's been really frustrating. And, and I'd love to hear what, you know, um, what everyone else, you know, has suggestions in terms of what we can do to change that. Because what, what this has made me realize is, you know, as a lawyer, I uphold the law, but seeing um, the, the way that the law has applied to minority owned businesses makes me want to take, um, definitely take more action to make sure that those laws actually do 
um, equally apply and support and benefit those that need it the most. Uh, Hillary, do you have any uh, anything you can tell us about, you know, how like what Congress thinks about how this played out? I mean, we kind of knew from the beginning there wasn't going to be the oversight that was needed that, you know, that was discussed in the media. I know there's, I, I, I just heard this morning that, you know, the, the House mm -hmm. passed a bill, uh, $2.2 trillion, but it's unlikely that the Senate will will pass it. So it's basically DOA. Can you give us any hope at all, Hillary? <laughs> well, I don't know if I give you hope, but I can give you a little bit of an update anyway. Um, okay. Yeah, so, you know, back in March, uh, Congress did come together pretty quickly and passed in rapid succession three stimulus uh, COVID-related bills. Um, and it was over about $2 trillion that was passed within about a month. Um, and that included uh, money for first responders, money for states, um, PPE, and um, that was when they created the uh, Paycheck Protection Program and the IDLE Program, IDLE um, Economic Injury Disaster Loans, those that actually already existed as part of the SBA, but um, the Small Business Administration, but for the first time, basically COVID was declared the, the D, the disaster in IDLE loans. So that's why people were eligible for those. Um, and then there was a, a quick realization that that was not going to be enough money. Um, not enough money and not, get, not enough getting to the right people. So they did make some changes in some later legislation to add some more money to the pot, to bring in more CDFIs, to try to have better outreach uh, to business, to uh, industries that needed it. But unfortunately, the process has become a victim of the politics that are here in DC. Um, there's arguments over how much money to spend. Are you going to give money to states? Are you going to make that money contingent upon schools reopening? Um, and ultimately, nothing has been enacted since the end of May. Um, and so they've been back and forth. The, the, every, we, could, we could talk about this for a long time. The, the upshot is last night, the House did pass another bill. Um, it is believed to be DOA in the Senate. Um, Mr. Connell will not bring it up for a vote. Um, and we thought negotiations might still continue, but as everyone knows, uh, the president was released, uh, was released that he has COVID now. Um, so we're not sure how much that's actually shutting down the administration here a little bit, who's gonna be available to do what, um, what the impact that's gonna have on Congress. We've already seen uh, the effect that's having on the markets right now. Um, so that might uh, cause some more legislation to come forward. We don't know. I would say that it's even more confusing now than it was uh, 24 hours ago. Okay, wow. Yeah. So, um, do you have any like uh, concrete suggestions on, you know, what you think should be in a, a bill that would be that would help make sure that the, you know, the gig economy is receiving funds, that minority-owned businesses are receiving funds. Um, you know, do you have any suggestions that didn't make it in the first bill? Um, I think people a lot smarter than I am and a lot more involved in this have come up with really great suggestions. I think the problem is the challenge is now getting Congress to look at this and implement it. Um, I mean, to be fair, the PPP program was put together extremely quickly. Um, so, of course, there were going to be issues with it. But then we have to take that and say, okay, this is what we put into place. This is what happened. These are the changes we need to make going forward. And we haven't gotten to that stage yet. And that's what we really need to get to. Mm -hmm. And so um, there have been oversight hearings in Congress. Uh, Congresswoman Nidia Velasquez from New York, and she's the chair of the Small Business Committee. I know she's held a lot of hearings on this. And people do have suggestions. We just need to get everyone to the table and actually mm -hmm. work through these ideas. Yeah. So I think that that's a really good time to talk about, like, who's actually, you know, who you need to, to think about when you're voting this November 3rd, because your congressman and your U.S. Senator are incredibly important people to, uh, in order to solve this problem. It's not really the president who's, I mean, the president can say, this is what I want to be in the bill, this is what I support, but in reality, the, the bill's being crafted in committees with legislative aides by your congressman and your U.S. Senator, and 
so those are the people that you need to go to first and say, this isn't working for me, um, you know, and, and why, correct, Hillary? Yes, um, but don't discount the role that the president and the administration has in this. I mean, the Secretary of the Treasury, Mnuchin, he has been in the room for all these conversations. Um, Treasury has been instrumental in the PPP program, um, SBA for IDLE. So uh, that's, they're very, very much an actor in this, in this scenario. But yes, um, this demonstrates the importance of having a relationship with your elected official. Right? So these concerns that we have as small business owners and why programs may not be working, you have to communicate that to the elected official because they're, they may not be small business owners, probably aren't. Um, they're certainly probably not minority small business owners. Um, and, and get that dialogue going so that they're not going to know otherwise. You know, otherwise, the laws are being created in a vacuum. You need people who are living this every day to have those conversations and let them know what's out there. And, you know, sometimes people say to me, well, why is he or she gonna listen to me? Well, you're a business owner in that person's district. It's their responsibility to hear from you. And they really do. And um, you need to have that conversation and let them know what works and, and, and what doesn't. Because even giving everyone the benefit of the doubt that you have the best of intentions when you implement something, uh, you know, until you actually see how it plays out, you don't know where, where the problems are gonna be. Yeah, and definitely don't make it um, like, you know, if, if your uh, congressperson is not, uh, you know, the same party affi affiliation you are, you know, that should not stop you from reaching out to them. Um, I have to say, I've, I've met more times with uh, an elected official that's not the same party as I am than I have with the other side. Um, and I do find, like you said, when you're speaking to them as a, as a small business owner, they don't have that experience. I mean, let's face it, everybody who's elected to office you know, at that high level, usually has a silver spoon somewhere, <laughs> you know, um, I mean, for the most part. So they're not going to have had the life experiences that you've had. And I would also add, so building on something Samuel mentioned, you know, the states have a role in this too. Mm -hmm. So, you know, make sure that you're also connecting with your local representative. Now, each state is different, but just using New York, for an example, they have a state senate and a state assembly. Um, you know, get to know who your, your local rep is in that scenario. They've got a smaller constituency, right? Yeah. Um, and so it may be easier to develop that relationship because their office may literally be around the corner from yours. Right. Um, and, and they know that street where you operate. Uh, so build those relationships as well because there's state resources to work with. State and federal gets together on things. Um, sometimes state rep representatives go on to be your federal representative. Absolutely. Um, same with your city councils. Whatever your structure is um, in your state, in your locality, get to know who represents you. Um, on the federal level, if you're not sure who your representative is, you can go to congress.gov and there's a place you type in your address and I'll tell you who your representative is and how to contact them. Yeah, and I have met with my state legislative uh, representative and it, it is very simple to get an appointment. I mean, you know, you just call the office, especially at the state level and say, you know, I'm a business owner, would like to meet and you can get an appointment very easily. With my congresswoman, you know, you can only meet when they come into the district because they spend most of their time in DC, but you can, you can always call your, um, your local congressional office because the staff there, their full, their full time job is basically solving problems between constituents and the federal government. So people, they get, you know, people in the office all the time, you know, issues like, you know, veterans fairs, social security, you know, Medicaid, Medicare, stuff like that. But if you're having trouble with the small business administration or, you know, some type of regulation that's impacting your business, you can actually go, you know, you can call them and, and tell them. And then if you do want to meet directly with your uh, congressperson, just like ask to be on their schedule when they come into town. And the, the key to us solving this problem is a collective consciousness. And right now we have to organize and become a forceful group nationally to be able to have attention of the governments. Um, I work directly with economic development for the state of Texas and for the city of Austin. And because we've organized here and we have a group that is a force, they listen to what we have to say. Also, they would like to establish a fashion industry here in Austin. So we've we've gotten the attention of the government and they're, they're, they're responsive to us because we do have an organization here and we do focus in on the, on the uh, uh, 
economic development because that's where you're going to get the response mm -hmm. from. You can talk to your government. I mean, I can talk to these government officials all day long, and they're going to glad hand me and say, yes, yes, yes. And when they leave, they forgot about everything I've said. But if you go through economic development, you work your way into the system. And mm -hmm. these are the people that are making the plans to how the things are going to be allocated. So that's the force that you need to start out with, but you've got to start with a collective consciousness. And we should look at how to form national organizations to where we have hundreds of thousands of people that are in these organizations. Mm -hmm. Then they start giving us the attention that we need as an industry. They have no clue that of the size of our industry and how many mm -hmm. people we employ. Mm -hmm. The big issue that I see happening right now is that with all the small businesses that are going under, we don't have an economy because an economy is when money changes hands eight times. And right now, the large corporation can't survive without a local economy. Mm -hmm. So they're missing that point. And when, when they realize that we don't have a local economy and you start having people lose their, if you're talking 15 million people plus have lost their jobs, how many people are gonna lose their homes, their cars, and everything that they know in a short period of time? And what they're doing with this PPP money is they're giving a guy a fish that he can eat for a day. They're not looking at how to take that money and build to help people move into the new era, move into the new jobs that are available. And there and there's plenty of new jobs in three areas of growth right now. One is in medicine, two is in robotics, and three is in new energies. Those are the three growth areas that we need to be focused in on and how and how to build those new, new, new industries out here in the country. We also need to put some money back into our grid and to our in, internet system. Obviously, for the way that Zoom is working, we can understand we have some, some like of, of uh, problems that we need to address there. There's a lot of things that are that are so common sense that we're not doing, but we keep hoping that the government's going to fix everything. And they're fixing everything. They're lying in their pockets really deep right now. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you've got billions of dollars that we can't even, you know, I mean, you know, there's 12 zeros in a trillion. Yeah. Uh, it's crazy. Somebody should sit down and just, everybody here should sit down and write one and 12 zeros and think about that we're now $27 trillion in debt. And I hope mm -hmm. they don't do another stimulus package because we can't afford another stimulus mm -hmm. package. All we're going to do is get hit with inflation. And if we get hit with some hyperinflation, it's over with. Yeah, yeah. Scary. But we can't just keep printing money, creating money out of air. And, and, and where's the interest rate at? Zero percent? Your money right now that you have, money is a liability. It's not an asset anymore. Hmm. Well, I, you know, one of the things that the fashion industry runs on is definitely the gig economy. And I know um, Dee and Miss Tanisha and Runa Ray, uh, you, you all run your own small businesses. Um, you work with a lot of people who are in the gig economy. Um, Denisha, I, you, I know you had, you, you have a brick and mortar, right? Where you teach your classes? Correct, that's where I'm at now. Okay, so tell us how COVID's affected your business. Uh, did you get any help from the government? And, and are there any things that you feel like, what kind of support do you wish you had from your government in order to help your business survive this, but also to, to thrive in the future? Well, just like uh, Sharon was saying, I actually thought I was going to get some support from my local bank because I've been there since 1997. Mm -hmm. I have my LLC account there. I have gotten a car loan. I've gotten a credit card and zero for a business loan. Oh my so God. I, I was, I was, I got to the point where I asked them, how, what percentage do you actually give to small black owners as, as far as businesses? And they didn't have an answer for me because I was really considering taking my business elsewhere because I'm like, if I can, you know, get a car loan, you know, with interest, I can get a credit card, you know, with interest. Um, I can have a bank uh, account here with an LLC for since night since my LLC has been since 2006, but you can't give me a business loan during COVID. I was extremely disappointed. So uh, I had to pivot. I had to come up with different ways to um, support my business. And so I kind of became a fashion motivation apparel designer. So I actually have um, an online business where you can actually buy t-shirts now. 
Um, I have face masks that say Molly and Bootcamp on them now. I have face masks that say Keep It On Push now. So I had to pivot. I had to find other ways to support my business because I was not getting support from my bank. Uh, I did not get any loans. I did uh, have people sending me links to apply for black owned business loans. Um, I didn't get any, but what I did start getting, which I thought was very interesting, was solicitation via email. So they got all my information, and then all of a sudden I started getting these, oh, would you like for us to help you market your business? And that's $5,000 or $2,000 to be on social media. And so instead of them offering me any kind of support um, with a grant, I started getting solicitors to pay them to help my business be marketed. And I thought that was very interesting. That was from a few different companies. One was a fashion design company and another one was a actual black owned uh, marketing company. And they were supposedly helping black owned businesses with grants. So I got the paperwork and I ended up getting solicited, like seriously. So um, I decided as a person that I am, living on my slogan, keep it on push, I decided to find different ways besides just, um, cause I'm not, I'm not a designer, I'm not a fashion designer. And that hasn't gone extremely well. Um, you know, people and friends that know me, they buy my, buy my t-shirts or you know, my mask and things of that nature. Um, I did have a booth down on the 38th street where George Floyd was, um, you know, his situation. And so I did do that and, and, and that was fine, but it does not help me sustain my, my company, my, my door stand open. So what I decided to do was um, do what you're doing right now is uh, I'm glad that you guys reached out to me because now this is another platform for me to speak about what I'm going through, get my business out there as well. And I started to do um, what, what, what do they say? Uh, cross marketing. So I cross market. I started helping a lot of people that I knew that I was supporting in the fashion industry, helping them promote their business. And in return, they were helping me promote mine. And um, a lot of models are trying to get back to work. So I have a lot of younger models asking me what to do, Miss Anisha. You know, what do we do? What do we do? I'm fortunate enough to have agents that are still booking me, but some of these models are not getting booked. They're not getting opportunities now. And they're scared. They're now trying to decide if this is the right career for them now, you know? So... It is hard. It really is. And I'm fortunate because I'm in a small town of Osseo, which people in Minnesota don't even know where it is because it's so small. We have less than 3,000 people here. So I'm in an area where it's not a big city. So trying to get people to come to Osseo to do modeling is almost like, are you insane? You know, but I believe in what I do. And it's, it takes a lot. And so I'm trying to figure it out and I've been blessed because my overhead is not extremely expensive, but it's still another couple of bills, you know, lights got to be on and um, the rent has to be paid. And so uh, I'm trying to figure it out, to be honest with you, but I have not gotten support of, you know, the PPE loans or any, any kind of grants at all. And my bank was, like you said, Shireen, was a huge disappointment. I mean, I've been with them since 1997. I, that's how long I've been with the actual bank. And um, it's like a slap in the face, isn't it? Oh, yeah. It makes you say, why am I giving you my money when you won't even, you know, take right. a chance on me after all these years? And I have a standing building and I have a LLC with that bank. So they know I'm legit. But yeah. Well, and I think that what, you know, what you're talking about, the fact that, you know, you're in a small town. You're, you, you've got a building, you know, probably right downtown. I know, in, and yes. I live in a very no, small town. We have, we have several creative businesses in our small downtown. And, uh, and, you know, that's what brings these small communities to life is having the businesses like what, what you're doing where people can express their creativity and they can, they can learn uh, new skills. And, uh, and, and they're just as important to the life of a community as, you know, like a, a, a big employer, you know, and, and that's, you know, obviously what's getting ignored. Uh, and that, you know, that type, that changing that I think has to come, you know, from our leadership to, you know, to quit paying lip service to the importance of small businesses, because when it comes to legislation, they're just completely ignoring it. 
Yeah, like we even have a nice dance studio here. Like you said, it's very important. We have a Taekwondo uh, studio here, all right here within walking distance. And I've spoken to those business owners as well. And the Taekwondo teacher, he did say that he did get some, um, you know, some funding and he's white, white male, you know, and um, I'm literally within a couple of miles from him, you know, so. So why did he? Yeah, because yeah. what could be the difference between a Taekwondo business and your your uh, coach your modeling co coaching business? I mean, how could how could that be very different from the perspective? Yeah. yeah so I do. That does feel very like there like racism is involved in that. Yeah. Well, it's a lot of it because right. we don't have a community anymore. And that's what we have to develop is a community and we need a, a small business banking system. That's mm -hmm. not going to be the SBA because that's a joke in itself, just the way that it's set up and it's not even set up where it's, it's actually outsourcing money to people that are actually making money off of 0% interest. I mean, it's just amazing how they do that whole process, but we need a small business banking system. And it's going to be the it's going to be the key stimulus to being able to pull us out of what we're going through because we hadn't seen the worst of this yet. This is only the begun the beginning. And when we hit rock bottom, that's when people are going to start thinking a little bit different. Greed's going to run be gone because you know what's the use of having a Rolls Royce or if you can't drive it down the street or if you have the COVID and you can't go anywhere. You know, uh, um, it's it's going to change. We're being forced into a complete change of era, whether we like it or not. And we have moved into a new era and we've also moved into a new world, new dimension. And the digital dimension is what you've got to focus in on, on how to survive in this new era. And this COVID has really pushed us into a digital world, whether we like it or not. Mm -hmm. And the digital world now, just to kind of give you some understanding of what we're doing on the back end, so you'll have some perspective on where we're headed to right now, the blockchain, intellectual property, all the things legally that you were talking about earlier, we'll be able to be able to walk away from having to worry about all those things because it'll be in the blockchain. We also, your data, all these major companies right now, as soon as we go through this election, they're going to run into major problems with the way that they manage your personal information because mm -hmm. all of a sudden Europe is already understanding what's going on with these big companies and they're, they're locking it down. China's already locked it down. They're not going to let you in, period. And then the U.S. will wake up shortly and realize that we've got to change things. And I don't know if any of you watched the Senate hearings when they were interviewing all of the major companies. At the end of it, the thing that struck me the most is that they said, you guys are too big, we're going to break you up. That was the final statement of what they said in the end of the meeting. I think that we're going to see a lot of transition and changes, but we have to, as you said, be able to withstand it and make it through this. But that's where the creative thing part of it comes to. It's also where the collective consciousness comes through. If we are all creating our own community together, then we can survive this because we have the ability as a group to survive. But if we're sitting there trying to make it on our own and not utilizing what Melissa's given us today, a platform to communicate and understand, mm -hmm. we all are dealing with the same issues and how do we make it through these issues? We have a, a, a complete new world that we can build, very sustainable. We have to look at our, our raw materials right now because with India, China and Africa utilizing raw materials to the extent that we are. We're already having shortages of raw materials. So the circle economy is gonna be very important in our industry going forward. So we all have to get focused in on how to be more sustainable as an industry. We also have to look at the, the supply chain. Uh, you gotta be closer to your market now. And that's why all these companies are building these factories here in the US now, because they try, they're trying to get closer to the market. There's so many things that we have to pay attention to versus what's going on in Washington because those guys are gonna do what they do. I mean, that's that's their, their zoo up there, let them play in yeah. there. But we have to look at what we have to deal with on Main Street. And if we don't build our Main Street together, we can't sit back and wait for them to help us. It's true. That's they, true. No life, they know life, ain't no lifeboat coming, okay? And, yeah. it's, you know, and what they're doing is they're putting money in the boats that have holes, have holes in them and they're gonna sink anyhow. So they're putting money in the businesses that won't survive this. Wow. And yeah. you, you and I will survive because we know how to survive. We're scrappy. We're scrappy and we'll make <laughs> there it. There you go. I like that word. That's what yeah. I love about what Lujisha said earlier. I'm going to make this transition. That's what we're about. We make this, this country work. And they, they can be greedy and mess and destroy the whole economy the way they're doing it. 
or they can look up and say, God, these guys create 90% of the jobs. These are the people that makes this, make this company, country work and we're destroying it. And where are you gonna go? There's no other place like we have here. Mm -hmm. right. yeah. And to kind of piggyback on what Samuel was saying, um, building a community tonight, I actually am going to a meeting with a, uh, someone who actually thought just like that. They said, we have to build our own community. We're gonna have, I think 50 founding partners. Did he say, he might've said 10 founding partners and then we're gonna build out to 50 and then try to spread it. And I was asked to be one of the uh, founding partners. So we're having our first meeting tonight. It's for the industry. It's for those who have to be in the industry and the person that's actually uh, creating this, I was really nice. It was really a pleasant surprise. He was on uh, RuPaul's Dragway Race uh, BB and um, he lives here in Minnesota. He went to New York for a while. Things didn't pan out there, so he moved back home. And he, we're having our first meeting tonight, and he's starting something similar to that, where we can come together as a community and help each other within the community, help our businesses promote. Like if I'm doing a fashion show, if I'm doing an event, we promote within our, our industry to help people come and support that to keep our, you know, to support financially, you know, as far as whether it be a virtual fashion show or whatever, buy tickets, support. So that meeting is actually tonight because we're trying to uh, create, well, he's trying to create our own um, community in the industry. Yeah, here in Minnesota. Well, I'll reach out to you about that because next Friday, our mastermind is actually uh, going to be community leaders from different cities in the United oh, okay. States who are working to build their local fashion community. So oh. we'd love to have you involved in that one as well. Yeah, that's also, tonight, so I'm excited. Mm -hmm. Melissa, yeah. we, started, uh -huh. we started an organization here called Textile Global. We have over 200 members here in Austin. Okay. And within that organization, we were able to get funding from the city on this incubator that we built here. We were able to acquire Glober, Global, uh, Glober, Gerber financing to the tune of $13 million. Wow. Uh, to the city gave us another million. ACC built out the facility for us. If you work as a group, you can do a lot. I mean, we've done that just in the last three years. We have another 600 acres that the government has allocated that uh, we're building out a new school. It's a two year school that will take over where we're starting out in the community colleges where we built the incubator at. So for the first two years, you can get an associate's degree in fashion. The second two years, you can go to the new campus that we're building now, which is over 600 acres, and it's going to be a tri-sector school, meaning that we have private industry business and education working together. So you, instead of just going in and reading from a book, you'll experience the new technologies because I have I can't say who's coming in there, but we have some multinational companies that are coming in there to be able to, and these companies are looking for ways to come in and help them. Mm -hmm. So you've got to build an organization for tri-sector to be able to get everyone to work together. One of the biggest issues that I had here was getting the city and the state to realize they were duplicating efforts. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, the right hand doesn't know what the left hand's doing. Right. And so now people are starting to sit down and communicate, and we're starting to have a direction that we're all moving in. And I feel blessed that we're here in Texas because our, our economy here is booming. I mean, I don't think mm -hmm. we'll even feel the downturn of what's about to happen in this whole country. Uh, we're the 11th, the eighth largest economy in the world and probably will be the fourth in a short period of time. Uh, the, the thing though here is there's a community that's building and you have to look at how to create that community right now. And there's gonna be, uh, the first meetings we had, there was scrapping and fighting and egos and everything. And finally, when we got everyone to sit down and realize, what are you arguing about? What are you fighting about? What is our goal? Mm -hmm. What is our mission here? What are we, where are we trying to go with this whole thing? And all of a sudden, the people that were looking to Oregon like, they left, so good, come. But then the few people that stayed, now we've built it. The incubator, we have an incubator at McCallum High School. We have over 200 kids in this incubator. Two of the kids last year got full scholarships in Parsons, New York. Wow, that's great. So, so we're seeing the build, yeah. building and growth coming, but it's coming from a collective conscience and people working right. together and seeing that we have a common agenda and we can't make it on our own right now. And that's how we, this country was founded. That's how we built this country to what it is. Forget about all these government people that want to fight and argue about things. I mean, I looked at that the debate the other day and I thought, my God, this is an embarrassment. Yeah. And well, that is, 
that's something wonderful about Austin because I lived in Austin for 20 years and I know that because everybody there has that entrepreneurial mindset. It's a real can do attitude. And so you're always looking at how to solve a problem. What's the next new thing. And, and that, that is beautiful. What's happening in Austin. I know we, have, we have incredible universities here that are also yeah. open up to the collaboration and some of the projects, which I can't even talk about that we're working on now within the fashion industry. It's just amazing where we've already moved, jumped, leapfrogged out into the next era without anybody even knowing that we exist here and what we're doing with metal biotech integration of, of where cool. technology now. That's the place to be for sure. Well, D, well, I know so you're I have family there, so I might have to come visit. I have family in Texas. <laughs> yeah, sure I still my, have my first first cousins. Cousins. And something yeah. you, should, you should be looking at now is the interactive digital media world. And you could actually start probably doing photography with the the ladies that you have there in with the new technologies that we have in 3D. And we need a lot of that right now because- We have some beautiful models that we really do. And I'm not saying it just because <laughs> they're mine, but, or, you know, well, um, we should, I'm in charge. We can, we we really can talk it. later, um, give me a call. Uh, there's, uh, we're doing national and international photography because we have, we've got all types of products. Like we've got a magic mirror now that you can try to close on. We can scan you from head to toe and it'll pull products from any of the inventories within our ecosystem. We've got a lot of- I will of be calling you, Samuel. I'm gonna hold you to that. And Runa, Runa, I have an Indian model. My first model ever from India took my program. I've been in business, I've been in business 2006 and my first one from India. And I want to, she just completed her uh, program. She's taking her pictures. She's getting her model comp, her portfolio. I told her I was going to at least just, you know, introduce her, submit her to you. Because I was, yeah, that just happened over the weekend. Amazing. Weekend. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, but there's, there's just opportunities if you really look. I mean, Confucius say out of chaos comes opportunity. Yep. Yeah. And well, we'll, I'm sorry. Oh, did I think we're sitting on the most opportune. Okay, you froze for a second. I yeah. said we're start, we're sitting on the most opportune time in the history of this country right now. And so if you let your if you quit hanging on, I have so many of my friends that are calling me from our industry and they're like, Sam, you know, we just went to market. There was no one there. All there was there was salesmen and vendors. And I told them, I said, You gotta quit hanging on. If you're in the out in the sea and you're being pulled to the bottom of the sea, let it go and you'll yeah. rise back to the top. Everybody has to let go of what was in the past because it's That's a, right. This is a yeah. brand new world, and you've got to look at where the future is coming and what we're, what opportunities are out there. And right now, because everybody's looking at the past, they're not seeing the opportunities. And it's wide yeah. open if you look at mm -hmm. what's going on in front of us. And I see a beautiful world. I think we're going to move to a higher consciousness mm -hmm. in society because it, once we hit the bottom, people are going to learn what it's like. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And suffering gives you a better consciousness of how yeah. to deal with the world. The other thing is we're going to move to a higher level of intelligence. One of the things that my one of my partners said to me, and I'll share this with you. He said that only thing of value going forward are things that you cannot connect. Yeah. Are things that what? You cannot connect. Uh, okay. Your creativity, you can't connect. You can't. Yeah. The, the human resource is one of the things that you have to have, and it's going to be the yeah. most critical thing. So the human resource is what we have to look at, how to cultivate now and move it into the next era, because that's what we're going to need more of. Right. And Dee, I know you've got your pulse on a lot of entrepreneurs, because as a public relations company, you're you're constantly working with small to medium-sized businesses. What's your perspective on how they're surviving covid um, and, you know, and I know that you are very passionate about voting. Um, just t tell us where your clients are at right now. Um, so, um, first of all, I want to ditto what Samuel said. Um, you know, you can't rely on the government to save you guys. Um, you have to be resourceful. You have to be collaborative. You got to think outside the box and you cannot um, get stuck on, well, this is the way I've always done business or else you're not gonna survive. Mm -hmm. um, secondary, you know, our agency, DCG Media Group, we work with big companies, we work with small companies. One of the things that we had to do as a company and with our clients, mm -hmm. um, you know, we work with companies that are, you know, lifestyle, health, um, fashion, beauty, 
the fashion of beauty has had the hardest time. Um, right now, the, the, the other brands that we work with, which deal with, you know, like, for example, I have a company now that is doing these like high tech um, brand that needs to get out there because it literally removes 99% of the surfaces bacteria, which spreads COVID. And I'm so excited about that. So those are the companies that are going to survive because it deals with science. You know, I deal with doctors. Doctors are never going to go out of business. So, um, you know, we've had to like work with different ways on how to work with the doctor, how to pitch them to, P, you know, to, to get a PR because PR, a lot of companies I know has self have suffered. My company, I, I don't know if it's because the way my brain thinks, I'm always thinking outside the box. I'm one of the most resourceful person that you've ever met. I think it yeah. comes from my background, the way I was raised. I'm a Bronx girl and you learn how to survive. And so you cannot be like, woe is me, and oh my God, I, I get it. We've all gone through it, but you cannot stay there because you will not survive. You know, Chase, for example, I have had a, a business account with Chase. I was gonna do a press release called Chase People Away because that's what they're doing. <laughs> Chasing people away, like what the hell is happening? And so you can't, you know, I did get an SBA loan. Was it the one I wanted? No. But I'm not relying on the government, on grants, on saving me from like the PPT, PPE. I mean, there's so many like adjectives. <laughs> so right now, I'm relying on D, DCG, <laughs> group, DPR. I am like, yes. what yes. can I do to pivot? To well, how can I help my clients? How can I help my fellow? business owners because you know i get free advice i charge for that i get it for free you know why because we need to survive we That's need right. to be collaborative we need to help and stop being bottom feeders and go well what's in it for me what's in it for you is you help me i help you and together we grow that is what needs to happen in I, our industry i have a a a form that I sent out to all my partners I have over 40 collaborative global partners that we work together the way that you're talking now. And it basically says that we take our human resources and our monetary resources and we combine efforts and we have a common goal. Mm -hmm. And you'd be surprised how much we can accomplish in just a short period of time. And yeah. did you get a good response? Oh yeah, they, I have, like I said, I've got 40 collaborative, you know, I've built a platform where my platform is, is the platform that all these major, these companies that are new companies are API and into. And they basically have access to our customer base and, and to the, the people that are moving forward because it's all, a, I, I have an intranet system where I don't want the 80, I have these people coming to me telling me about all these followers they got and everything. And I'm the guy that they come to to make those products for those people. But I could care less about how many followers you got. I want to know the 20% of the customers that do 80% of your business because that's all that matters. The rest, all they do is cost you money. And that's what mm -hmm. a lot of these bigger companies are finding out right now. Ask Amazon. How much they love to drop about ninety percent of their customers right now. Hmm. Yep. Wow, that's interesting. So, Runa, because you have a global perspective and you're so involved in the UN, um, I mean, there's a lot of things that have. I mean, you know, every, I think most people in the fashion industry are very, um, you know, interested in moving the supply chain forward and being more. Um, you know, having more sustainable fashion businesses. Uh, and that, of course, comes down a lot to voting. You know, vote, mm -hmm. you know, uh, you know, the U.S. removed itself from the Paris Accord. Um, I, I'm not sure if India is still in it, or I think they are, right? Yeah. They are. yeah. So how, um, tell us a little bit from your perspective of what you see going on globally in sustainability uh, and global warming that you think uh, people need to be aware of when they're voting? Um, I think this is a very important time for all businesses and especially from the fashion industry because we have decided, we have determined that fashion, the, fa the fashion industry is one of the greatest polluters. And what's happening with small businesses is that they kind of getting to be quick on their feet and hoping and trying to help change the crisis at, at hand compared to the large corporates. Yeah. 
uh, we've had the Paris Accord, which has been extremely important it because it makes you, you know, think global and act local. It brings a lot of countries together where they report on their greenhouse gas emissions and the funding that can go towards um, certain countries like India who need a part of this to kind of work towards a greener, cleaner um, economy. Uh, unfortunately, in countries like India, they still depend on coal. So you have a lot of villages that are being displaced. You have a lot of the trees being cut. A lot of corporate mm -hmm. sectors are coming in. And, you know, you have open fires and a lot of like uh, uh, black lung disease, which is like occupational hazards. Now, how do you control that? Because all that uh, accounts to climate change and all this is man-made. So the Paris Accord brings in countries who want to work together and put everyone on a global scale. At the end of the day, you also have organizations like the Lloyd's Register who just um, uh, presented the Seaweed Manifesto. This was on the 24th. And this was to feed the entire world using kelp because it is regenerative and because of the population uh, boom that's gonna happen in 2050. So they, they, uh, they produced the seaweed manifesto to help um, eliminate world hunger. And at the same time, also help a lot of uh, budding businesses who want to go into the kelp industry for, for, for food. You also had like 75 organizations that joined WWF. And I think it was in Australia where they decided to create another manifesto for renewable energy. So you have a lot of opportunity, even when it comes to fashion and renewable energy. But like I said, it's all this is man-made, right? Like all the climate change we're facing now, we're not facing the climate change that brought down the Roman Empire or the bubonic plague that brought it down. Uh, and we need to understand that you do have natural causes for climate change. It could be a tilt of the Earth's axis that could cause it, but most of it is man-made. And right now you have geoengineering who's trying to gain time because they're like, we're going to emit these gases into the air that's going to block the, block the sun. Or we're going to have like these silicon balls that are going to be spread on the Arctic ice. Sheet. And this is from an organization in California. It's very sad because they need to do this because they depend on organizations to uh, uh, cut down on the carbon emission and, and uh, alternatively try to bring down the uh, global warming, which is going to be less than two degrees. But coming back to what you said about the government, it's very important that governments understand that it's not about just a particular country. It's not just the US, it's not just, the China, it's not just China or India. At the end of the day, if the sun does get blocked out, which people don't see, but I did see it uh, two weeks ago when the, there were fires in California, we woke up and there was no sun. Mm. It's never happened to me in my entire life. Watch out, it was red. It was at nine o'clock in the morning and I kept looking out and it seemed like it was eight o'clock in the evening. And it really looked scary because when I went by and I was like, oh my gosh, this is really serious. But a lot of people don't see it because it's like a silent killer. They're, saying the, um, they, they're predicting that the um, Arctic ice caps are like going to be depleting in, by 95% in the next few years if something is, nothing's going to be done to it. Um, as a global community, we need to think as we need to think as, uh, globally and for everybody in it. Like again, I cannot repeat myself. It's not separate countries, but for that we need our leaders or the people who we choose to understand. Yes, there's a human side to the nation, but also as a collective, we need to realize that we need peace, justice, equality, climate change. Unless and until we have the mindset within ourselves only then we will probably choose the leaders who can reflect our desire for a better world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you know, that goes back to what Hillary was saying about um, the topic of immigration and the visas, because the fashion industry really relies on the, the global uh, community because so much of the supply chain is all over the world. And even, you know, there, there was even things that like happened at New York Fashion Week where, you know, designers and their teams couldn't get into New York because they couldn't get a visa in time and that mm. had never happened before. So that caused major disruption and loss of, loss of money 
because you know your business isn't running smoothly um but we we do have to as a fashion industry we do have to realize that you know we we have to think globally and we have to the the health what's going on in india and the health of india or the, uh or what's going on in africa it it affects our industry mm -hmm. on a daily basis and so uh what the environment is in that country is just as important as what the environment is in our own country exactly mm -hmm. Yeah. So, well, I appreciate everybody uh, on today. Does anybody have any final words that they'd like to share? Melissa, I just wanted to make two quick points before we close up. I really enjoyed, I guess, the third point. I really enjoyed everybody's um, perspective today. And, you know, I, it's nice. You get kind of bogged down in D.C. Um, with the negativity. So it's really inspiring mm -hmm. to hear some positivity from this, from this group here and about the importance of coming together as a community. I think that's that's hugely important, but um, the idea that you can't rely on government, I just caution we don't want to discount them either, because at the end of the day, those are the folks making the laws. They are controlling a lot of the money, right? Yeah. And if there's too much of that mindset of, oh, those folks are all just corrupt and we don't want to deal with them in D.C., mm -hmm. then people don't vote. And we all know what happens mm -hmm. when people don't vote. So the, the final point is vote and then follow up. You've got to hold them accountable once they get into office. Go have those follow-up conversations be like, hey, you ran on a platform of supporting small business. Here I am, I'm a small business. These are the points that we need to have addressed. We've got to have a dialogue about this. That's yeah. So. Absolutely. I, I had a congressman tell me one time that if he gets 10 letters from his district, he knows he better pay attention. And I think that we all know um, that you know, we all know enough people where we can actually, you know, reach out as a group to our legislators that we don't think is paying enough enough attention to small business. So I think it is great, Hillary and uh, and Samuel, to have uh, thought leaders like you uh, helping us focus on how we can collectively use our industry. Uh, to become an advocate instead of being all of these small individual businesses, we can come together and and make it make a change uh, for you know to help all all of our businesses grow and be safer. I have one more thing. I have to brag a little bit. I have been nominated for a 2020 Advanced Manufacturing Firm Award for New Technology in in the minority industry. Congratulations! Department of oh, <laughs> uh, it's from the Department of Commerce and, and the Minority Small Business Association. So, that's hey, wonderful. But, Congratulations. Awesome. Well, that's exciting. I, I know all awesome things are always happening in Austin. So it's just uh, wonderful to have you here and, and, uh, and having that forward thinking uh, experience that you can share with us. And I have lots of technologies that I'm more than happy to share because we're creating so many new things as, as there's so much new that's out there that most people yeah. just are not willing to open up to. And the blockchain is probably one of the strongest elements that we're moving into now. And then artificial intelligence, the amount of artificial intelligence that we already have working that most people don't even know exists out there. Yeah. yeah. And I think that technology, I know you and I have had conversations about fake technology and, and, uh, and that's something that we need to get uh, fashion designers more educated on. Uh, because that, you know, if we're going into an economy where it, you're not going to be able to sell your line to a department store because those department stores no longer exist, you're going to have to rely more on a direct-to-consumer model, and that's when fit becomes critical. Um, One other thing, too, is on all of the designs with the blockchain, we have the ability to utilize those, those designs for on-demand uh, production. Mm -hmm. And you'll get a royalty every time someone uses your design. Well, we are going to, we'll have to, uh, we're going to do a, uh, a topic in January on technology and what to expect for 2021. So we'll definitely, we'd love to have you on to, to discuss that. Um, and I'm, and you know, um, with Fashion Mingle, I've always thought a lot about how do we solve uh, the issues that would help designers uh, be able to sell direct to consumer. And so I think that the technologies that you're working on are really critical for the future of the independent designer. Well, 
And thank you everybody for joining us. Have a great weekend. We appreciate all of your uh, insight and it was just a great conversation. Thank you, Melissa. Bye, Bye everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.